Hello everyone, I'm Darko and Misto is behind me. He will be joining you a bit later. So we'll from, we are from Nanobit, a creation company, and we will be talking about mobile games to the cloud with Python or how we, uh, as a company, made a transaction from a more, uh, more mobile from a mobile-based uh, gaming to a one that is cloud-based. So I will divide this talk into three parts. The first part will be my me, then Mistral will take over, and then I will finish. So let's get started. So how is this uh, talk going to be uh, divided? So we have uh, four parts, the intro and the requirements, the Python backend, but you will see that later. But I want to tell you what our objectives are. Our first objectives is to show you how we connected various technologies using Python, how we created a scalable architecture as a result of it, and how we are using Python in our company on a number of places. But the second objective, which I find more important, is to show you the lessons we learned, the challenges we faced, the difficulties we had, and what the problems were when creating such a system that has a lot of customers, that has a lot of uh, players which are, on, which are on smartphones, and which problems arise with smartphone gaming and stuff like that. So who are we? I'm going to just talk you through. This is going to be a short part about our company. We are Nanobit. We are a creation game development company. And we started in 2009. And up till, until 2011, we were all developing applications. And then we started developing games. Because in that time, the games were a more profitable and more interesting part of the industry. So uh, after we switched to games, we decided, OK, our games are on the smartphone, but we need some kind of a backend on, on the servers, which are going to connect the players of our games together, like a social part of the gaming. So we started developing a backend server in Python. And after that, we, all, we saw a steady growth. We had all the games we developed connect to this backend. But after some time, that backend, backend became too slow and too, it wasn't sufficient enough for our new requirements on, in our new games. So as you can see, we are using Amazon and we have a lot of instances and we have a lot of requests daily and that's rising every day and every year. So how did we use Python in the past? Like I said, we needed some social, social features. So we started with our first iteration of server, which, which was pretty easy. We used simple HTTP server in Python, and that, that uh, lasted for about a month. And then we realized that that won't work. We switched to a more robust and more proof solution, which was Apache with Django. And that was OK for our requirements back then. Our requirements were only to connect the players in a social way, so they can, so they can view each other's games, they can uh, send gifts to each other and stuff like that. After that, we added some more functionalities like updates in the games, push notification settings, and stuff like that. And we added a secondary server, which was for our in-house analytics system. And that was working pretty well. But we only had one big issue. We had only vertical scalability. So every 12 months, our server would become too small and would, wouldn't be able to handle the stress and the number of requests. So we had to, uh, to bump up the server. And that lasted for three years. Every 12 months, a bigger server. And we wanted to have horizontal scalability, but we couldn't because we had the problem with save games, which were, on, which, were, which were saved on the disk. And this would not allow us to have horizontal scalability. So a change was needed because of that. So why did we make the change? So we had a new game. This new game had new requirements. And these new requirements were, OK, let's have a better multiplayer. Let's have players who play against each other. And when you have Apache, that's not possible. Because Apache is a pre-fork worker-based web server, which doesn't allow you a lot of consistent, persistent connections. So we had to change that. Uh, another thing, we had MySQL. MySQL wasn't good enough for stuff like that. You couldn't, we had problems with MySQL when we developed the analytic system because we had like 50, 60 million, uh, million rows of data in one table and we had to join it and that didn't work. So we decided, okay, we're gonna change that. We're gonna make a solution that is more scalable that could allow us not only to have the social part of the game but the entire multiplayer. And one other thing, we decided, okay, we're gonna change, we're gonna put the game logic of the game 
on the back end. No longer will the game be played only on the smartphone. It's going to be played on the, on the back end from now on. So a player would send a request to the server every time something happens in the game so that we can have save games on the server, that we can have players that play on multiple devices. And when you have save games on devices like we had in the beginning, you have problems with cheating because as soon as a player can reach his own, his own save game, he can cheat. He can just change the number of like coins he has to 4 billion. He can change the price of some stuff in the game to minus 2 billion. And when he buys the stuff, he gains 2 billion coins. So that, that was an issue. So we decided we have to change that. We have to, we have to stop the players from cheating like that. So what was the goal? The goal was to have a system that would scale horizontally. Every part of the system that was primary, primary part of the system could scale horizontally. Uh, we had, wanted to have an automatic deployment because up till now we had to upload the source code each time to the server and that was not feasible enough. We had to upload it, we had to restart the, ser the, the Apache each time we decided to change something. And we wanted to containerize each part of our backend. So like if we have layers of backend, we wanted to have them transferable, easily transferable between uh, instances, between servers. Since, I, like I said, uh, the, game, the game logic had to be uh, transferred to the backend. That meant that each player had to have a persistent connection to the server. And Apache, like I said, wasn't good enough for that, so we had to find a solution. How to have like 10, 20, 30,000 of players which play simultaneously and each of these players have a persistent connection to the server. So another thing, up till now, until now, uh, the game would pull new data from the server. It would uh, send a request, it would receive a response from the server. We wanted to change that. We wanted to have the server push new data to the, to the games, to the client, each time the new data would appear. So uh, we decided to use a sort, a sort of a events-based architecture. We had a number of requests that would be sent in a batch from the client if those requests would not go through, they would be sent again in like three or four seconds at that. That uh, allowed us to have, uh, to have to the, so the data would not uh, be lost in transaction, in, tra in the transfer and stuff like that. And the cheating, it made cheating very difficult because we uh, tried to, to each request that would, ally, uh, that would arrive on the back and would be checked to see if this request is, is possible. Like for instance, if a player wanted to buy something in the game, we would check if, he, if this player has enough coins, has enough, uh, any, enough gems or, or any, other, um, any other resource in the game. So, why did we choose Python? We already had Python, like I said, we used Django, we used a lot of things in Python, and that was pretty nice for us, and we wanted to continue that way. As I, like I said, we needed a web server that would allow us to have a large number of persistent connections. And Tornado, Tornado fits perfectly here because it's made for that. It's made for persistent connections from the clients. And after a couple of thousand connections to one Tornado instance, we decided, okay, we can start another instance, we can have a, a proxy in, the fr in front of that that would load balance between it. We wanted automatic deployments. Fabric is also great for that. We had Fabric connect to our Amazon EC2 instances, check for each type of instance with tags, and we used Boto for that. You can see Boto on the slide too. And we had workers. Workers were part of the system that would, that would process the requests that arrive from the smartphones, from the games. Since we had a working Django server, we wanted to have some sort of backward compatibility. So we can reuse the database data, we can reuse the code, and we can reuse the stuff we already had that was required for the new game. And we had a lot of databases. We had three databases, and they all had great frameworks in Python. So Python was the solution for that. And we decided, OK, we can go with Python from, from, the, from this part on and continue the way it was used until then. So I'm going to leave you to Mislav. He's going to walk you through the architecture and the parts of the system. So I'll show the ar architecture better on the diagram later. But uh, for now, the diagram, uh, the architecture is divided into several layers. Uh, a proxy uh, uh, 
routes the request to the web servers. The web servers talk to the queue, which, uh, which talks to the uh, web, to the workers, and they talk to the da databases and send a uh, reply back. Uh, everything is horizontally scalable, and uh, uh, every part that needs to be scaled and is a unit in this uh, uh, layer uh, is dockerized. So uh, that makes deployment really easy. Uh, so Python is great here because not only did we develop the code uh, that uh, implements the system logic, the game logic, but also uh, it works great in binding all those services together with, the, with its libraries. So everything is in a virtual private cloud, so, and only the um, proxy, the Nginx proxy, is available to the outside. You can see uh, how the data travels to, through the system. Uh, blue lines represent the inbound traffic, and the yellow lines represent the outbound traffic. Uh, inbound traffic uh, comes through uh, the HTTP requests, and the outbound traffic goes uh, through the WebSocket. As you can see, we, we use um, uh, React, uh, Amazon RDS, and Redis as our uh, backend. Uh, for the uh, web, uh, web server part, uh, it, it, it consists of two parts, the HTTP uh, layer which uh, receives requests and the WebSocket layer which pushes the responses back to the, uh, to the game. The Nginx uses IP hashing so the persistent uh, connections uh, are possible and WebSockets, uh, WebSockets can uh, survive. Uh, the, when the request comes it goes uh, to, the web socket, to the web server and is pushed to our in-house built queue. The responses are um, the responses come uh, through Redis, and we use Redis as a queue. We use simple list, and the uh, uh, web sockets block on the uh, uh, on the list until a request a response arrives. That gave us some problems, but we'll talk about it later. Now, uh, the workers uh, are single threaded Python programs. They are Dockerized and they are connected to our queue. Uh, we had to use our current our queue because of some issues with React. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And um, uh, they receive uh, requests from uh, our queue. Uh, each message from client has a, a unique message type. And when we develop new games, we just have to uh, process uh, different events that are specific to that game. And the rest of the system uh, stays the same. Our queue is written in Go. Uh, we, ha uh, uh, we had to write a queue because of an issue with uh, React when, uh, because of its architecture, it doesn't support transactions. So when multiple, uh, multiple points are right to the same data point, they can create uh, what they call siblings, which are pieces of data with different weak locks, and you have to manage that, uh, that uh, yourself. We solved that issue by having a queue um, which routes requests for single users or single connections always to the same worker. We use uh, ring hashing for that, and uh, so that uh, makes sure that uh, every piece of data that is written to is written by the same worker, and they will never uh, write multiple times to the same uh, data point. Uh, the queue detects when workers go online and offline, Everything in the architecture is made that everything is detectable and messages will queue up until new workers come up or it will rehash and uh, start using a different number of workers. So uh, the technologies we used are Nginx for the proxy, Tornado for the web server, Zero MQ is used uh, on several places so that we can uh, turn off and on several components and uh, the messages will go through as soon as it's turned on. For the databases, we use React Redis and MySQL. Uh, we use Redis for everything. We use Docker for all the components. We just have to make a git push deployment master, and uh, post receive hook will build the Docker containers, uh, tell the, the fabric will tell uh, we, the instances which have to be restarted that a new image is available. They will pull the image, restart the Docker, and we will have a new code running and SQL alchemy for everything SQL related. So, Dark Kobo. So, as you can see, we use Python to bind various technologies together. That works great. And as you can see, we have a web server in Python, we have workers in Python, and we have them connecting 
various databases, clients together. But I'm going to talk you now through the lessons learned, because when developing such a system, you always face difficulties. And we had a number of difficulties, some more specific to the smartphone part of the industry. So one of the first things, mobile devices have mobile connections. Mobile connections can be slow. When a person walks through the, through the, through the street, sometimes it disconnects from one tower, connects to another tower. It connects to Wi-Fi, it disconnects for the Wi-Fi. So, you have connections which drop and new connections which start. And we had, had that problem because we, TCP doesn't help you when you try to discover connection drops. So we had to fix that by monitoring our connections frequently. We had to ping from the client to the server. We had to ping from the servers to the client. Why? Because each time a new connection would respawn, it would steal some of the data which arrives to Redis. And that was the problem. So we used uh, publish and subscribe in Redis to fix that issue. We had to, to inter-tornado communicate between tornado instances because to, we had multiple tornadoes and when a connection would drop, no other tornado instance would know that it, it is dropped. So that was a big issue. It's still an issue and I think it's, it's a problem with most, with most smartphone connections because they drop frequently. Our, our old system also had this type of problems, but Apache would fix it for us. You had like, when a player leaves the game, it would leave a hanging connection which would drop only in three or four minutes, but that wasn't the issue then. Now it is an issue. So we had to fix it with multiple things, with multiple, on multiple places, and that was the biggest issue. Another issue is what Mislav said. React and race conditions in React. So React does not allow you to have, it allows you to have multiple workers write to the same data, but when you do, you have a condition which you have to fix. React just tells you, okay, you have a condition, you have two siblings, now you have to decide which data is the correct one, you have to merge the data yourself. And that was an issue to us because if, we, if two workers write the data to React, then the workers would have to know how to fix the issues that arise. And since we have a lot of requests that come from, from the games, each request has its, has its own request type, we had to know how to fix each request, each request type, and that was a big problem. So we decided, okay, we're gonna just skip the problem, we're gonna pretend the problem isn't there, we're gonna fix it like Mislav said, you're gonna have one worker receive all the data from one client, and this data would arrive in the same order and one worker would only write for his or his, for his client and that would allow the client only to have one worker for him and that fixed the issue because there were no multiple workers writing to the same data point. So another thing, SQL data. Uh, when we use SQL it blocks our single threaded nature of our workers and since workers have to process a lot of requests we had to make sure that it, they run as fast as possible. So we decided, okay, we're gonna, drop, we're gonna pu push some data to additional threads, which would write to SQL only when there are no other data to process. We decided that this data is low priority. Some of the SQL data is low priority, and it can be written in two, three, or four seconds after the request was processed. So the main thread would not block, the main thread would be able to process as much as request as possible, and that in general would increase the throughput of our system. Another thing, Tornado and Redis, they don't work together quite well because Tornado does not allow you to block anything. It has to go, uh, is, is, it is asynchronous, but if you try to block in Redis, you have to block on the web server side. And if you block, like on a block pop, blocking pop or on a, on a subscribe, it would block the tornado itself completely. So there were a couple of uh, <coughs> solutions, but both solutions we tried had some issues. So we had to fix those issues. We had issues when we tried to disconnect from Redis and stuff like that. So we had to implement some new stuff on that part. And that was a problem. And another thing, our React. We have a React of five databases and we, we had one problem when one React instance crashed and we didn't know about it because we were in the middle of development and we, have, we had this one server crash for about one month and everything was working fine because React healed itself magically. We didn't know anything happened until one day we tried to connect to this instance that was down and we 
we realized that it wasn't responding to pings or anything, but the data was secure, data wasn't corrupted, everything was working as it, as it was supposed to work. So what's in the future? Like, like we said, we dockerized every container possible. And Docker is a great new technology, and I think you have a great talk tomorrow by our colleague, which will, which will show you how to use Docker in a, in a development environment. I, and I, I would suggest you listen to that, because it allows you some great stuff, especially on the production like this. You can transfer complete images of, uh, of, your, of your code between servers. And Docker now has a native Python support, so you can write Docker, Docker containers from your Python code, which you have for automatic deployment and stuff like that. Another thing we are working on is an automatic, automatic testing facility, which uses a lot of Docker, and it allows you to, it allows us to run a suite of tests on a new iteration of our web servers, our entire backend, to see if each request that arrives would always yield the same response. And since we have two connections currently, we have one connection which is HTTP, which has receiving requests, and we have a WebSocket that is only for the responses to the game. We want to unify this to one single connection because, because it would be much easier than it is now. This also brings us some issues, but we are trying to fix it with one connection. And one interesting thing, when we developed our first game using this backend, it required five months to do it because we had to write the entire backend from scratch. But the second game was finished in a month and a half because we only had to transfer the game logic from the game to the, to the backend. We only already had the entire working backend, the web servers, the queue, the, the workers, and we only had to transfer how to process the requests that arrive to the server. And that, that would allow us our, to have our new games, which would, which would be developed, to also need a lot less time than the first game did. So that's, that's it. You can ask the general some questions if you want. Thank you. Well, we send it in a JSON form. We, yeah, the, the, the colleague was asking how do we send the data from the, from the client to the servers, how, it is, how it is formatted. So we use JSON to format the data. Uh, we try to, we wait for, for like three seconds to see all the requests that are going to be sent to the server, and then we send it in a batch. Uh, if this batch goes through, it is marked as completed, and it isn't sent again. If it isn't received, if, uh, a, if a, a message isn't received that it is processed, it is sent again in the next batch, but the next batch always has the same order of messages like they were produced in the game. So basically we have a JSON data which has requests which are requests that were generated in the last three, four seconds that word process. This is one type, and the other type are messages that are uh, critical, high priority. They are sent instantaneously in, as a one message. Those messages like, are stuff like uh, a player tries to attack another player, a player tries to uh, request the current leaderboard and stuff like that. that so data that is needed as soon as possible. Well, we didn't have it for the first game, but we are doing it right now. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, <laughs> I always forgot. It. So the colleague was asking what's our method of testing and staging in our system. So we didn't have it at the beginning, but now we are doing this automated testing, which would allow us that as soon as we do a git push, we would spin off a new backend in Docker, and it would have, have unit tests for each, for each request type that that is in our system, and it would try to, use, to start some use cases in the game, and it, it then would, uh, would try to run those use cases and see if the, the responses in the database, in the game, are as they are supposed to be. So. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the PubSub service. So you said you're both using UMQ and Redis. 
So what was the reason to use Redis for the PubSub services instead of zero Q, which supports PubSubbing too? Well, the, the question is why did we use, uh, we use both zero MQ and Redis, and why did we decide to use Redis as a public, published subscribe service and not zero MQ? So basically when we started using zero MQ, we tried to use it in place of the custom in-house queue we developed. And we, were, we realized that it didn't support what we needed. And we already had Redis doing this stuff. And since Redis is, is very powerful, it allows you to do blocking pops, publish subscribes, key value storage, everything you need. We decided that as we are already using Redis for this kind of stuff, we can use it as a, as a publish subscribe. So that's probably the main reason. ZeroMQ isn't as much, it, uh, it isn't so much used in our system as Redis is, so basically that's the reason. Um, you said you use Tornado. Um, have you, uh, also try other stuff like uh, GeoWeb with Socket.io, and so why did we choose Tornado? So basically the question is why did we use Tornado, and did we try to use other technologies such as WebSocket EO and stuff like that? So when we started developing, we decided we needed a web server that would support a lot, large, large number of persistent connections, and the choice, we, we did some research, we did some Look, some documentation and some stuff like that, and we decided that Tornado in that point was the best solution because it it had uh, great support and it had connections with uh, with Tornado, con with the Redis connections with Zero MQ, and that was what we needed at that time. So basically, that was the reason we did it. But we are currently looking into finding an alter alternative because we are trying, like I said, we're trying to unify the connections, only have one connection, and that would allow us to, have, to try new technologies and see if something else would fit into the shoes of the, the tornado fits right now, so. Yes? That's a great question, I'm gonna repeat it. So the question is how do we uh, deploy web servers because when you deploy web servers and have, if you have a persistent connection, this persistent connection would drop and what would, the clients would then send requests to a server that doesn't exist, basically. So we have, the, the client is uh, full bulletproof, so to say, to connection drops. If a connection drops, the client would know immediately because when the but Nginx and tornado drop, it, it drops the entire TCP connection, and the client would then reconnect immediately to a new web server which is deployed automatically. In, that's like a second or two delay, but uh, since we don't have to have re responses that are immediate, we can batch the, we can send the messages in batch in every four or five seconds, that isn't an issue, so we decided that we can stop the, the Docker containers and start them again in one second, and the client would not know that anything happened. It would just reconnect again. So. Okay. That's it. Okay. The question is, why did we use web sockets, and only for the for the returning part? You mean? Yeah, we wanted to have a persistent connection, and one of the solutions was to have a low-level TCP connection, but we wanted to have a connection that is a more of a higher level, sort of like HTTP, because our requests that arrive to the server are also HTTP connections. So we decided that to use WebSockets because they are up an upgrade to our current architecture that we already use, and they are an upgrade to do the connection we already use for receiving requests. And the only, we, we needed something that would, uh, that would have a stream-like connection, and WebSocket fitted the build perfectly here. So basically, that's it.